So, good morning. Uh, yes, so good morning. My name is Jan Piet, or JP. I'm JP Mintz. I'd like to speak to you this morning about um, uh, MQTT. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> MQTT with a focus for system administrators, for Unix people. Um, disclaimer, uh, two disclaimers. First of all, I was informed uh, on, I think it was Tuesday, that Wi-Fi connections with uh, your own equipment don't work here. The, the equipment is sort of killed off with DOF, I think. It's called, I was able to verify that yesterday at the uh, U90 and since then I've been able to sleep. Um, unfortunately, I promised you blink and lights and uh, they, 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 they won't work. I don't know, I don't know why. I was uh, trying to convert everything to cable. Most, uh, most of the demo will work, but some of it won't, won't which is a great shame. Um, so uh, another disclaimer, I am not a BSD developer. I think I'm the only one here who's not a BSD developer. Uh, so I apologize for that. <laughs> I see from the audience that another two or three, so that's good. Um, that can be right. <laughs> I was actually hoping to become at least a, a porter on Tuesday with the importing uh, workshop, porting tutorial, but that was, uh, that was canceled, so I'll have to wait a little bit. I've done a lot of work, uh, I do quite a bit of work with open source. I've uh, done uh, quite a few contributions, <laughs> so for example, the whole documentation system of the Ansible configuration management um, is fine. I've done a number of things, including, for example, um, creating a project called OwnTracks. We do, um, those are two applications, one for iOS, one for Android, which do uh, person tracking or vehicle tracking uh, over MQTT. If you're interested in that, I'll show you a screenshot later on, but if you're interested in that, speak to me um, later on. Um, question, has anybody, have you heard of MQTT? Who has heard of MQTT? Very nice. That's approximately 10, 12, 15 people for the camera. Um, who can tell me why I have this bottle of pineapple syrup it's from a company called Maison Routin in France? Why do I have this bottle of pineapple syrup here on this slide? You all lie, you don't know anything about MQTT. The product is called 1883, and that is the YANA assigned TCP port number for MQTT. <laughs> okay, they also make a very nice chocolate syrup, um, the chocolate. Right, so what is MQTT? MQTT is a standard, uh, it's not an RFC, but it has been standardized by the OASIS. It's a standard TCP based um, transport protocol. Uh, pub sub mechanism, publish subscribe. I'll explain a little bit more what that means in a moment. It was originally designed for unreliable networks. Unreliable networks, that's what we have when we have a mobile device. So you have Wi Fi here, you go outside, you have 2G, you have 3G, maybe you have ATT that's offline or whatever it's called here. Um, so uh, unreliable networks means precisely that, okay? Um, it is a binary, uh, has binary payloads of up to 256 megabytes. These 256 megabytes are a little bit theoretical if we are doing something on a Mac or on a normal computer, then of course we can handle payloads of 256 megabytes. If we're doing something on a microcontroller, um, the size which has a couple of kilobytes of RAM, then it's of course completely out of the question that we handle that kind of payload. But in theory, it goes up to 256 meg. MQTT is very fast, very, very lightweight. We compare that, for example, with HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, um, HTTP is very verbose, so even if you just pick up a payload of a few bytes, you have quite a bit of header information that goes up and down. MQTT does not have this other than a so-called topic, which we'll see in a moment. Um, MQTT is ideal for low bandwidth networks um, and uh, high latency networks. A MQTT has a support for TLS, transport layer uh, security, um, which you might so called SSL, um, unfortunately. MQTT supports authentication, supports payload um, encryption, of course, because that's not part of MQTT, that's whatever your payload, whatever your application does. MQTT supports um, access control lists between client and server. The server has a specific name, we'll see in a moment. It has something called last will and testament, which we'll be talking about, and so you'll show you a bit more um, later on. And supports so-called topics. And the way what topics are is we have in our MQTT landscape, we have a server in the center. And the server is in MQTT terms called a broker. The broker is simply an MQTT server. There are different kinds of um, MQTT brokers. I'll show you a few in a moment. 
and we have clients. These clients uh, here on the left, for example, we have uh, publishers. Here on the right, we have subscribers. But uh, there's uh, absolutely no reason why a client should not be a, a subscriber and a publisher. Publishers um, will publish a message. A message is attached to a particular topic. A topic is like an address. It's a topic. It's a hierarchical um, UTF-8 hierarchical uh, string. And um, this message is, together with the topic, published to the broker. The broker accepts this message and will forward that on um, automatically to any subscriber on the right who is subscribed to that particular topic. We'll see uh, some examples of topics in a moment. So if there is a subscriber for a particular topic and there is then a publisher on that topic, then these two entities can speak to each other. Well, unidirectionally can speak to each other. If I publish a message on a particular topic in MQTT, and on the other side there is no subscriber who's listening to that message, then the message disappears. It's just thrown away. Uh, topics, by the way, are not created. The fact that a publisher publishes to a particular topic means that that topic then suddenly exists. Um, under the condition, we're ignoring that for one, under the condition that the broker will actually accept such topics. So we have access controllers which um, enforce particular um, well, access uh, rules on uh, clients uh, that are connecting both publishing and subscribing. These topic names are hierarchical, so UTF-8 um, hierarchical string. Um, up to a length of, uh, what was that, 64 kilobytes, so should be long enough for a while. Um, hierarchical, separated here by slashes. So for example, it, we could have a device, uh, maybe a hot water kettle, which publishes its temperature on a topic called home slash ground floor slash kitchen slash kettle. Yeah, we're talking about a kettle. Or we have, for example, a financial service, which is publishing under finance slash uh, currency here euro slash rate. On the other hand, a subscriber can subscribe to particular wild cards. We have plus as a wild card. This plus means one level, so one level of hierarchy. In other words, this subscriber, which is always subscribed to finance slash plus slash rate, would get any messages published to finance slash euro slash rate or finance slash um, Canadian dollar uh, slash rate, or US dollar, or yen, or whatever slash rate. Okay. Would not get, however, um, topics or messages published to finance slash yen, for example. Without your okay. And we have, on the other hand, the hash character. The hash character is also a wild card and stands for any number of levels from here onwards down. And as you can see, these, by the way, are, uh, most of these anyway, are topics from sort of real life topics. So here we have some sort of uh, a UUID. Here we have a, um, a topic sent by a little, by a little uh, microcontroller, et cetera. So topics are something that we create, that application developers create to decide that they will speak to each other. Now, an MQTT broker, what we saw earlier, let me just go back, an MQTT broker, the server component here in the center, um, is a little bit, at least in my mind, a little bit like a quadrant. So publishers just dump stuff into that quadrant, into that pot, and, and you have it sent on subscribers, under the premise that they are permitted to do so, where subscribers take it out. So for example, let us assume you have purchased a little something, a little appliance, maybe a little thermostat, and the thermostat is publishing temperature in Fahrenheit, you bought it in the States. Can I know It's metric, no? And you bought it in the States, it's publishing in Fahrenheit, nobody knows what Fahrenheit is, but uh, so you want it in Celsius, you would write a simple few lines code to uh, publish a, a bit of a subscriber, which would subscribe to that particular topic of that device, of that sensor, extract the temperature that is being published in Fahrenheit, convert it to Celsius, and republish it under a different topic. Okay? So like a huge melting pot of stuff that goes that goes in and out. I once many years ago called um, MQTT a little bit like Twitter for my network. And that's the way I tend to uh, that's the way I tend to see it. Um, 
messages that are published um, are published with a so-called QoS, quality of service. And there are three qualities of service which MQTT uh, provides us. They are numbered 0, 1, and 2. Quality OS 0, or QoS 0, it's called officially at most once, is um, something that we call fire and forget. So in other words, a publisher will fire off a message and will say, well, if you get it, fine. If you don't get it, it's also fine. So for example, a sensor or a device that publishes information that will be republished in a few seconds anyway might use QoS 0, or a temperature sensor. You know, maybe it's publishing every 10 seconds. And if we lose one of the measurements, it doesn't really matter, because there'll be another one in the coming 10 seconds. Okay, so this is a very fast, um, very fast thing. Com happens over TCP, of course, because MQTT is TCP-based, but it's a little bit like you can compare it a little bit to a UDP data point. Maybe it gets there, maybe it doesn't. By the way, typically in your local area network, typically it will get there. I don't think I've ever seen a QoS zero message that uh, got lost. A QoS one, uh, assured delivery means that the message will get there at least once. You have to be careful though, because the message can, could get there multiple times. Okay. A QoS two is called once only or assured delivery. Uh, sorry, exact delivery. And um, once only means exactly that. The protocol guarantees, as long as the device is operate correctly, guarantees that the message will be transmitted exactly once. Okay. Now, MQTT Brokers is, uh, as I say, MQTT Brokers is part of your network. You have the, sort of the message bots and you have devices, clients and subscribers, and you have your MQTT Broker. Now, these MQTT Brokers, there are, there are several, and there are two that I would like to introduce to you, just uh, uh, by name at least, and we'll see one um, in a moment. Mosquito is an open source MQTT broker created by a man called Roger Light. And this is not a typo. The, the English word Mosquito is, of course, spelled with one T. But Roger was looking for something that contains MQTT, and that's why we call it Mosquito. Yeah, okay. you can Google that. And um, so it's uh, written in C. It's very fast. It has uh, ACLs. It supports uh, ACLs of uh, plugin uh, access controllers, for example. It supports all the typical standards, TLS, TLS with pre-shared key. Um, it has bridging, we'll explain in a moment what bridging is, logging via what is called dollar And it's available for all, yeah, for all typical uh, distributions. On, on OpenBSD, for example, you can do package um, add mosquito, or on FreeBSD, you can do package add mosquito, package install mosquito, okay? So that's, that's uh, very fun. Um, Vernon MQ is uh, written in Erlang. It's uh, also a very modern, very fast um, system, supports web sockets, and supports clustering, for example, if you need to cluster um, your MQTT brokers. Has uh, support for so-called webhooks, and also for Lua plugins, in other words, plugins written in the, in the Lua language. And there are a number of other brokers, like uh, things written in, um, in uh, JavaScript, for example, or in Java, HiveMQ is a broker that was, until uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, was closed source and has now been opened. RabbitMQ, for example, has an MQTT plugin. So there, there's, there's, a, there's quite, a, quite a vibrant uh, community around uh, the, uh, the, the, the broker area. Um, I mentioned that if once the term bridging, uh, MQTT brokers can be bridged together. And this bridging means that we are able to, for example, in a data center, here on the top, we have an MQTT broker with a number of clients, and we can um, we can lead out via a single a single channel by a single TCP connection, either uh, initiated from inside or read from open from outside. We can lead out any number of um, topics and, of course, their payload. So this is the possibility to, for example, transfer um, differ differing information, differing data. Um, from a data center out into maybe a different data center or into different applications. And I'd like to show you an example in a few, uh, in a few months of how we can do that. Um, MQTT also means we need utilities. And there are two uh, utilities which are very common. One is called Mosquito Sub, which has a whole bunch of uh, options. And basically, it's Mosquito Subscribe with a minus T topic. And Mosquito Sub will connect to your broker and subscribe to messages of that topic. 
for those topics. And on the other hand, from the command line, Mosquito Pro, Mosquito Publish, will publish a message with a particular topic and a particular payload to that broker. Okay. MQTT comes um, for a whole bunch of different languages, or has bindings for a whole bunch of different languages. C, of course, JavaScript, almost anything. I think the only language that I found that has no direct MQTT support is COBOL. Who knows, who knows COBOL? But by the way, there's a COBOL bridge for Node.js, so if you want to <laughs> It just happened that IBM released last week uh, running COBOL on Kubernetes. Yeah? Yeah. COBOL on Kubernetes, that's, that's hardcore. That's IBM. Very good. Well, right, just a few, uh, few short examples that you see that is really quite trivial. Um, I thought maybe in Python we should do something. We have um, an excellent library um, also written by Roger Light, the author of the Mosquito, the Mosquito Broker. Um, for uh, publishing a message to an, an MQTT message. Um, MQTT.single, you specify a topic, you specify a payload or a message, and that's it, off it goes, okay? And of course, there are a number of options. We can specify hosting, port name, et cetera, Q, quality of service, um, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, the subscribing side is a little bit more involved. Uh, it's a little bit more involved because we connect to a broker and uh, then we will typically loop forever. So now we open a thread, loop forever. And as soon as the message comes in, we will um, invoke a callback here on message. And the on message callback gets the user data on the message and then we'll handle this message. So for example, in this particular case, simply, simply print it out. Okay? But relatively simple. That's why I said earlier a program subscribing client, which would extract our Fahrenheit converted uh, tem uh, com uh, Fahrenheit temperature, converted cells, and republish it, would really be something quite trivial to, to implement. And the result is, of course, that if we um, have our subscriber running and we publish our uh, appropriate, for example, by a command line or by an application, then we get that data. A small C program to do the same thing using libmosquito. It's a little bit more involved, but relatively trivial. This program is a full, fully, uh, fully functional program, which will publish a message to this topic and will connect, publishes a message, disconnects a message. Okay. So this allows us, for example, as administrators in, as Unix administrators in long running, or as developers in long running shell scripts and long running programs, to, for example, periodically print what we're doing, where we are. Here, a trivial example, using a shell function. Um, and then the, um, the, the person sort of tracing this, sort of using logging or whatever the person is tracing this, could determine what, what the program is actually doing and, and uh, at, at, what, at what state uh, this, is, uh, this program is actually in. Now, there's a gentleman here in the audience called Dan who one day said oh, he has a problem. He would like to see what uh, users are logging into the system. And he wrote a uh, very long uh, blog article from which this quote comes out. And uh, I like this very much, so that's why I wrote it here. Um, and what we did was actually, um, what he originally did was, with all due respect, horrid. And um, I thought we'll make it, let's try to make it a little bit less horrid. And well, the way we did it was to uh, use, actually to use MQTT. What Dan wanted to do, and something which is actually quite clever, what Dan wanted to do was to determine when somebody logged into a system or to his systems. And in order to do that, what we did was create a panel to C program, which is called HAIR. There's a story behind it, you can read up on it here, why it's called HAIR. There's a tiny little C program which is um, coupled into PAM. Now, the PAM person, is he in the room? No, thank you. Anyway, the PAM person will probably get a fit uh, because we did that. I'm talking about Michael, of course, Michael Luca. Uh, so, this, if you don't have PAM, like for example, OpenBSD, you don't have PAM, we can do the same thing 
um, with the one in state RC script, which is invoked by SSA. So in other words, what the result was that um, we have a small program which is invoked whenever a user logs in or whenever a secure copy or a secure FTP uh, logs in to the system. The publisher puts small, um, a small payload, a small JSON payload, and that is then sent off to a broker. And what Dan then did was to use a number of utilities to then get that payload by MQTT and then, for example, create email out of it or send it to push over as a notification or alert or whatever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so these are things that we can do relatively easily with MQTT. And the way we did it here is the example that we would use if we, let me just go back, if we didn't do the TAM uh, mechanism, which I do not show here, but we do it over SSHRC. A small script which uh, uh, invokes hair and uh, sends it off to the QTT broker. And the result is um, that a payload with a JSON, uh, JSON blob, which host name, which remote, uh, uh, you, uh, which remote host, uh, what service, the timestamp, which TTY, which, uh, uh, which user um, was actually, actually caused that, uh, that this remote payload is then processable and then transferable, sort of in a plug and play way, transferable to other systems. Here we see that login as an email, which is for sent by SMTP, and we see it, or we see it as a what is it, that pushover, yeah? as a pushover with, an, uh, with um, the uh, appropriate alerting onto, um, onto whichever kind of notification service or whichever kind of notification system you desire. So generally speaking, for the sysadmin, MQTT is a very interesting protocol because we have a possibility to, uh, within a data center, within a group of machines, we can send our own data, we can send, do things like uh, collect telegraph data. I'll show you an example. Telegraph, do anybody know telegraph? For the influx people? Telegraph is a wonderful utility which has a huge number of inputs of I forget how many, uh, 20, 30, 40 different inputs, files, uh, open SMTP uh, statistics, um, JSON inputs, HTTP logs, with contain logs, etc. And all these inputs here with uh, statd, for example, all these inputs can, for example, create MQTT publishers or other things. But I'm interested in the MQTT part. We can use ConnectD, for example, also, also exists for uh, OpenBSD or for FreeBSD. We can use ConnectD, which uh, also collects statistics, CPU statistics, memory statistics, and is able to produce and publish these over MQTT onto our MQTT bus, yeah, into our quadrant. And on the other side, we can, for example, by a broker, then bridge them out into, into another broker, into, into a different world, into different, uh, different systems. This is an example of what uh, a telegraph looks like. You have uh, a configuration file that looks a little bit strange, but it has a number of inputs. Here we have an input DNS query or an input exec, where I run my own uh, uh, programs. And we have an output MQTT with a particular broker, uh, broker specification for broker and port number, and um, a topic prefix. And then here on the right, we see the uh, telegraph, that's the topic uh, prefix, BSD can, that's the host name, users on, and here value 16, that's this name that is being shown here. Okay, so all sorts of data that can, let me just go back one, all sorts of data which can be published over a single MQTT um, connection. Now, um, any questions so far? Good. Well, yes, maybe good. Um, now, I'm um, I'm very sorry. I'm very sad because um, uh, because uh, things should have worked and um, will hopefully work. I'll show you in a moment. I'm going to um, pass some stuff through the through the room just for you to see. Well, I'll continue talking just for you to see. There are a few rules to the game. First of all, all this stuff comes back here, please, okay? <laughs> Second rule is I will also give you, in a few moments, I will also pass you something. Um, now, that there's very specific rules for this thing that I'm going to pass you, and that is, first of all, please don't pull the plug unless I ask you to. If you pull the plug, the demo doesn't work, maybe understandably. Second of all, there's some sharp edges on the bottom of this printed circuit. Don't hurt yourselves. 
blood flows down, and I don't want that, okay? And uh, also, please, if you wear rings on your hands, uh, try not to create a short, because that would be a pain. That would then just not work. The first thing I'm going to hand over is what you see on the bottom right there. It's a little so-called pocket router. Here's one with an antenna. The antenna is optional. I've got one running here. I'll lift it up in a moment to show you later on. I don't want well, I'll lift it up now. I don't want to disable anything, and it doesn't work anyway. This is very, very similar. It's just an awful baby blue color. Uh, these are little pocket, so-called pocket routers. They run a version of WRT. Um, so yes, I'm sorry, wrong shop, but it's, that's what they run. Um, and uh, on the one that on that little baby blue one is a mosquito, but there's a mosquito broker running on it, okay? And we'll talk to that mosquito broker in a moment. On this one, there's also a mosquito broker, but we can't talk to it because it's off, so I'll, I'll hand it over. Um, these little pocket routers are very inexpensive, or rather inexpensive. They cost somewhere around uh, 20 euro, 25 euro or something, which is what, uh, 30 US dollars or 40 Canadian dollars approximately. Um, this thing, is a, I'll sh there'll be a photo of it in a moment, it's called a Sonoff, which is a little device which allows me to, on the one hand, bring in 220 volt or 110 volt, on the other hand, uh, output 220 or whatever came in on the left, and um, uh, we can switch it. And there's a little microcontroller in it, and the microcontroller that is in here is a little bit like what you see there, is a so-called ESP8266. Now this ESP8266, is basically like an Arduino. Who knows the term Arduino? Everybody, okay, oh, well, almost everybody. Arduino is a, a wonderful product created by uh, a bunch of Italians who had this fantastic idea, and they were able to create a, a, a thing which brought electronics closer to people who have no idea of, of electronics, for example, myself. And Arduino is about cigarette, uh, cigarette shaped, uh, cigarette size, cigarette box size, a little bit larger than this thing. And cost somewhere around 20, 30, 40 dollars. Okay. Now, what, uh, there was then a Chinese company, and the Chinese company said, "Oh, we can do that too," and they made something that is Arduino-like, speaks the same language, we can program it on the same things, has the Wi-Fi on board. Okay, has Wi-Fi on board. I'll try and show you in a moment. There's a, there's a little problem. I'll try and show you in a moment. Is Wi-Fi on board, and um, it's sold not for. Uh, 20, 30, 40 dollars, but for four dollars, including registered mail from China. Okay, and one of those things is in here, so we can program that. And the reason I'm showing you is we can speak MQTT. These boards they speak HTTP if we prefer, or we they speak MQTT. I like the MQTT version. Okay, let me hand that over. It's tiny. One of the Sonos uh, Sonos costs, I think, uh, 10 US dollars, 8 US dollars, somewhere somewhere around. There. Don't don't quote me. Okay, so these ESP 8266, that's the name of the that's the generic name. They come in different shapes and sizes. Here, I, uh, sorry, I forgot to translate the prices. These are euro prices, so you see the, the sort of the smallest version costs uh, uh, a euro fifty. Um, then you have the, the so called node MCU, they just have a little bit more RAM and they have more pinning and so on and so forth. But more, don't start, if, if you're new to this whole deal, like I was. Don't start with something like that. It looks interesting because it's cheap, but it's just a pain because it's very, very difficult to get to get your code onto. It, yeah? Start with something like a Node MCU, um, which is controllable all over five volts, which makes your life easy. Or start with something called a let me just show you here yeah, a Wemos D1 Mini. These things are absolutely gorgeous. I find they're gorgeous. They cost about four euro. They're powered by a USB and uh, they're really solid, very good, uh, really, really uh, very good things. Now, the Sonoff thing that is going around, please see if you can get it across, um, that has an ESP8266 somewhere in here, and that's what it looks like, okay? And there's also Electro Dragon, for example, cost five euro fifty, okay, which has very similar in functionality, and uh, has one input, so power input, 220 volt, 110 volt, and on the other hand, two, on the other side, two relays, so we can control two uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, two outputs. Two outputs, yeah, thank you. The German TÜV, which is the organization that checks technical validity of equipment and how 
good your cars are, whether they're all rusty or all that. I don't think they exist in North America. The German TÜV would get an absolute fit if they saw one of these. It's, uh, I, I personally wouldn't leave one unattended, but okay, you can, you can do it. This, the Sonoff is a little, bit, a little bit higher quality, in my opinion, uh, a little bit better. So, we will see one mini. It's a little microcontroller. It speaks, um, if you want, it speaks MQTT, it speaks HTTP. It can be programmed in uh, three different languages, I think, at the moment, in uh, MicroPython. It can be programmed in Lua, um, and it can be programmed in C, uh, just like you would program in, in Arduino. That's my, my preferred. Uh, my preferred uh, way of doing it. And these Wemos come with little cute little shields. You can't get enough of these. There's, for example, a little OLED shield. Tiny little screen. It's smaller than sort of half a stamp. It's, it's minute. Mm -hmm. And you have an SD card shield, and here's a, a thermostat shield, and there's a relay shield. And the one I'm going to show you, and it looks a bit large. I'll pass it around in a moment. Don't worry. But I have to plug it in in a moment. But I'm, af I'm afraid that as soon as I plug it in, It'll be remotely de -auth, I think the term is. And that's why I'm waiting until the last minute. Um, this is a little button shield. So the actual, the actual, um, um, the actual the microcontroller is really just sort of this, this bottom plate. Okay. And the thing on top is just the, just the button, right? Just the button. Did you have a question? No, no. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. And so we can program these with the Arduino IDE, with the uh, um, integrated development environment. And of course, we can do all sorts of things. Now, let's, um, let's do the following. Let's take a terminal and... Um, can you see that? Increase the font. Is that legible? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now this screen is split in two. At the bottom, we have, uh, I have in front, I can type. And at the bottom, at the top, we have um, the mosquito sub command, which is subscribing to all topics that are going to the broker. The broker is currently on this little blue pocket router. Okay, so in theory, if I'm not lying to you, what I should be able to do here down here is mosquito pub. Minus uh, H, post name 192.168.8.1. Minus T, topic is BSD can DMS 11R0. And minus M, payload, what, what, you, what would you like me to say? Hello. Hello, world. Hello, world. Hello, world. <laughs> okay. And as you see on the top, um, exactly that has happened. Okay, so we have the topic here on the left, and we have the the uh, the actual payload. Now, what I'm going to do is switch to the top bar, and <laughs> occasionally I'll hit enter so that you see that the, that the data is flowing. And now comes something which I hope will work for five minutes. Yesterday in U90, I was killed off after less than 60 seconds. So I don't. I didn't know that existed. I was, we, were, we, were, we heard this on Tuesday or on Wednesday. Uh, apparently, the university is able to send deauth package. I didn't know that existed. Deauth package which tell the client to to unauthorize, to, to disconnect from Wi-Fi. Um, I'm hoping that the Chinese implementer who, did, who wrote this doesn't know about them. Okay. <laughs> so I'll pass this on in a moment. This is the thing is booting up, it's a little blue light. And you see there a whole bunch of information. Now go ahead, I'll pass it on. Go ahead and, and press click. You see, whenever you, you click the bottom, you see the there's a there's a, a topic all the way to open and then true. Or if I hold it, it's now open false. Open true, open false. Okay, go ahead. Remember please, no blood, okay? <laughs> so this little microcontroller, this little ESP8266, is now connected to my to my Wi-Fi, which is being provided by this little device. Which Wi-Fi it is doesn't matter, of course, but it happens to be provided by this little device. And um, bring this in. And oh yeah, this little application on there, the program on there, written in C, in the C language, 
And this little program is uh, checking the, um, the state of the button and will then publish an appropriate um, information. So you should, there we are. And of course, we can, we can do in between, we can do all sorts of other things. No? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking to a broker. Now this broker will, on a hardware like this, do somewhere around, I don't know, 10, 15,000 messages per second. Okay, so it's relatively, rel no, it's very likely. If you want something really big, you would buy, for example, IBM message sites. They make appliances that do about 15 million messages per second. Okay. I'll tell you why they do that. Well, is this still working? Is the what that's alarm? Yep. Okay, good. Now, do me a favor, or do us a favor, please. Who has it? Who has it? Okay, would you do me a favor? And um, we're going to simulate a crash. Now, there's something called La uh, LWT, last will and testament in MQTT. The last will and testament is exactly what it sounds like in real life. Yeah? Last will and testament, if you and I have one, we've written down, in the case of our death, please do this and this. Now, in the MQTT world, the, uh, an application is able to also set a last will and testament. Now, this is absolutely fantastic, in my opinion anyway, for anything that does monitoring. Now, if you would be so kind on the battery side, so that, on the battery side, and just pull the plug. Now, it's, that's as dead as can get, okay? Now, that microcontroller, the software on the microcontroller, when it powered up, it said to the broker, please verify that I'm occasionally li alive. Once every few seconds, tell me that I'm alive. And um, in the case of my death, if you don't hear from me anymore, be so good as to, on this particular topic that I tell you, please publish this payload. So by now, exactly, it should have happened. You pulled the plug, thank you very much. And the application upon start had said, in the case of my death, please on this, sorry, that's not my escape sequence here. In the case of my death, on this payload, on this topic, yeah, dollar online, please publish the, the value of false. Now, this publishing of the value false would then cause, for example, my monitoring application, maybe Asinga or Zabbix or whatever you use, to say, oh, careful, uh, our sensor, our, our little microcontroller in behind tree number seven in Brazil has just gone offline. We have to sell, send Pepito to boot it back up again. Be so kind as to plug in anything. And um, so this last will and testament thing, this LWT, is really absolutely wonderful uh, for anything that has to do with monitoring. Um, how much time do I have? Five minutes, huh? Okay, so um, that basically shows us what uh, MQTT uh, allows. Oh, I'm sorry, I should uh, mention something here. When that little, thank you very much, when that little microcontroller booted up, it sent out a whole bunch of information, so for example, its own configuration, its version number, whether um, um, OTA of the air updates for the application are, are enabled. These, these devices allow me to, uh, to um, replace the software of the air. Imagine you have these devices built into a wall somewhere, yeah? or in a ceiling lamp, or whatever. You don't want to have to chase around, unscrew, take the whole house apart to find more. You can update them over the air, for example. Okay, so it's just here, yeah, uh, signal, Wi Fi signal. Uh, okay. Um, let me now. You can carry on switching. I, unfortunately, you can't. Uh, we, we can't see it. Put the mouse. I can't see it. There we go. Um, okay. So these little devices allow us to do uh, yeah, MQTT on little little devices, little hardware devices, you know, innumerable uh, types of such devices in order to, for example, do the internet of, um, what's the T stand for again? Toilets. <laughs> nice. Internet of toilets. I love this picture. Um, the toilet with a little microcontroller. You know what the S in IoT stands for, right? Yeah. Good. 
Okay, so last will and testament. This is what it looks like in code. It's called an LWT, last will and testament. In code, the way this happens is we, um, upon uh, connecting to the broker, just before connecting to the broker, we say, dear broker, in the case of my death, please um, send out to this topic here for example, client slash whatever topic, uh, the payload I have no longer, yeah, or some, some, some payload, some alert uh, system. Okay, now let's have a look at a few practical solutions. What is MQTT used for? MQTT is used for, for alerting, MQTT is used for metering, um, for example, the uh, gas pipelines, uh, European gas pipelines very often have MQTT sensors or sensors along the way which use MQTT to uh, transport information like flow, temperature of the gas, etc. just to, to know that the damn thing is still working. We have metering in, uh, for example, um, vehicles. We have lots of metering in vehicles, hospital vehicles, ambulances, things like that. There are logging applications location awareness, tracking. This is a, a screenshot of our uh, own tracks application. Uh, controlling uh, automation uh, because of the lightweight uh, capability. We have a lot of MQTT with uh, Unix utilities, for example, uh, Graylog, the logging system, Beaver, and Ansible, there's MQTT for notification. ConnectB, I mentioned, OpenHAB or OpenHAB, which is the Open Home Automation Broker, if you do home automation or home assistant if you prefer. They do MQTT a lot of the time. Uh, actually, GitHub are stricken through. GitHub used to be able to alert over MQTT and a whole bunch of other things. But they uh, they separated that all out. They, they ripped that out completely. GitHub now only does web sockets. That's why it used to be there. Wireshark has support for MQTT. Uh, Fluxo, respectively, we make electric. The two companies who, uh, Fluxo is, I think, uh, US American, I'm not quite sure. Um, Remake Electric is a Swedish company. They make uh, professional uh, electricity meters, which uh, come bundled with an open WRT device, which uh, sends out uh, metering information over uh, MQTT. The uh, Jenkins system, uh, for example, OnTrax, Telegraph, we've mentioned already. These are all systems that uh, that do uh, MQTT. So MQTT is is a very simple protocol. It's lightweight. It's fast, very flexible. Um, it has a certain amount of built-in security. It has payload encryption, or rather transport encryption, and we can add payload encryption. Um, it's usable on tiny, tiny hardware to show you. And uh, yeah, we can do really wonderful things with it. Right, just in time. Any questions? Yes. I'm sorry, could you speak up? I'm, I'm a bit hard to hear. Oh, what kind of security is there to be for that? Okay, that, um, I, I can answer that for, for this particular device. By the way, I can see in the back here. Uh, for this particular <laughs> device, I can answer that. Um, what we do here, what we do here is um, um, uh, TLS over MQTT, or respectively to the uh, MQTT over TLS. Um, that depends a lot on how it's actually implemented. So, for example, if you prefer HTTP, you would, you would probably hopefully do HTTPS and some sort of built-in authentication or authorization. There is no, or there are no, let's say, standards for such to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Have you seen, um, this is totally new, have you seen uh, a move for some uh, organizations to replace like this? To replace SNMP? Yeah. Okay, the question is, have I seen um, a replacement for SNMP with this? Yes, I certainly have. And uh, not only that, but we, well, we as pure of us, do exactly that. So um, if, I, if I may, I'm just going to very, very quickly go back to this one video. Uh, to this one screenshot, this to me, this is now very personal, but this to me is one of the main uh, main advantages of MQTT, what we can do in things like data centers, even just small homes, we can have a whole different number of appliances, of applications, of programs which provide data, which do data, and funnel this out of a one single TCP connection, over one single MQTT connection. Okay, so this will be port 1883, or rather, hopefully, it's CLS protected, and it's by default, it's 8883. 
Um, and on the other side, on the receiving side, since this, this all goes out around QTT, we've had, but on different topics, we can funnel it out into different uh, areas. So, uh, yes, as um, SNMP or replacement of SNMP um, is absolutely possible, uh, but of course, depends on what devices you want to control. So, for example, if you want to rip out SNMP, but your HP, whatever, IBM printer doesn't have MQTT, then you lose. Okay. Not sure if I. There is a lot of a lot of activity, a lot of application, a lot of programs, a lot of utilities which are uh, coming out with support for MQTT because of its versatility, flexibility. Do we have time? Yes, please. The message reliability aspect, is that handled entirely on the broker side or is it the client? That's a very good question. The question is, is the message reliability, so quality of service, is that handled only on the broker side? No, it's also handled on the client side. So, for example, message of QoS2, assured delivery, it's the basically the client that needs to do the work to ensure um, or to assure that the message has been uh, dropped at the um, or delivered to the doorstep of the broker and will then say, okay, I'm, I'm done. So what we um, oftentimes see, it is uh, particularly a new new hardware to oftentimes see, also of course in microcontroller area, is that for example, QoS2 is not, it's just not possible. QoS2, for example, means by definition that if you go offline or if you, the client goes offline, it must be able to come back up and then finish delivery. These things can't do that because they have no onboard battery. So the, um, the WEMOS or the uh, ESP8266 implementations of MQTT support QoS1, and that's about it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, in the end of for the mission, you know if there is any subscriber, or do you need to do a lot of sub uh, to deal with that? Um, the question is, is there a way for a subscriber to know that there's a publisher or a publisher to know that the subscriber is there? No, there is no way. Um, so MQTT, that is very important, and that's a very good question. MQTT is not an RPC, it's not a remote procedure call, okay? It's not a, a there and back. It is a there and back if you do it in such a way. So for example, um, if you tell a microcontroller, please switch light on, um, the light might go on, but it might not go on. Yeah? If you want, uh, for example, in your monitoring system or in your home automation system, if you want to know is the light on or is it not on, then you need some sort of back channel. So you would, you would uh, hopefully um, create a system by which you tell your microcontroller switch on, and if it then has switched on, it would respond, I have switched on. Yeah? On a different topic. Careful, must be a different topic, otherwise you start getting loops. Um, so, no. Yes. You you subscribe to a new a topic. Can you get the last thing that was published there? Very good or question. I uh, omitted to because of time reason. I omitted to uh, to say that yes, we have something which is called a retained message. So, for example, a publisher can uh, upon publishing even the the uh, the utilities have. Uh, that here yeah, minus R. Even the command line utilities have that. A publisher can can request from the broker to please retain the last message. For example, temperature sensor. Um, temperature sensor collects temperature once every 30 minutes and will publish and say it's now whatever 25 degrees. And please retain this. Now you as a subscriber come in and ask and subscribe what is the temperature. Um, if you don't subscribe at that instant when the publisher comes in, you would, you would never find out. You would find out at the earliest in about 29 and a half minutes. And so the retained message allows the broker to, as soon as you subscribe, give you the last known good value. Those are retained messages. And there is per topic only one retained message. Okay, per topic there is one retained message. However, we do a few tricks, for example, per topic with retained messages and with uh, QS, um, QS1 or QS2, we can actually get a whole bunch of messages. 
but there is one within. <coughs> yes? Kind of following on from that, so if you've got a sense of that, or, or a rocket publishing every 10 seconds, yeah. can you say for uh, every signal message, override the previous retain? <laughs> so you, you've always got that. Yeah, the question for the camera, the question is, if I have a, a publisher with, which publishes every 10 seconds, can I have the publisher or can I have the broker uh, sort of retain every six or every ninth or every whatever? And no, that's not possible. That, that, that the application would have to do. So your your publisher would have to, uh, modulo six, set the retain flag. Yeah. Ben? If I should have done that, it was written by an open BSG guy. So basically, I found it very useful. When I signed up for it, I got clients on my laptop, on my phone, also on my watch. So, quick demo of that appointment. Here's a sign in on a machine at home, eventually. And it should pop up. Oh, it just came in on my watch. <laughs> so, it's very reliable and very quick. And it's very interesting when you do a Cluster SSH stuff, 850 hooks. <laughs> um, I can show you a little bit of that. Where's my